We had some bad Chinese takeout, and my partner, Sarah, woke in the night holding her belly. What time is it, she said. Write down the time. Within a few hours, contractions were coming on strong, a full 60 seconds every four minutes. So we called the hospital and texted our doula and grabbed our go bag and drove. The next morning, after 27 hours of labor and five hours of pushing, after nine months of worrying and hoping and looking at ultrasound scans, after years of deliberating and wondering and negotiating between the demands of being on the academic job market and our deeper biological cycles, a new human emerged into the world, yowling like something feral, our daughter. Tears broke from my eyes as I hugged her and Sarah together, my chest opening like I'd found the ultimate source of joy in the universe and plugged in, streaming total utopian agape. First, I cried for joy. Then I cried for sorrow. A few minutes later, holding my daughter, Rosalind, and looking out the window over the hospital parking lot, the rows of cars, the strip mall across the street, the flat, ugly, rust belt sprawl of northern northwest Indiana, box stores and drive throughs drainage ditches and concrete and waste fields that might have once been oak groves, a world in which the landscape was ravaged and brutalized as a matter of course, in which any possibility for living in harmony with nature had been all but evacuated, in which the miracle of life was measured in dollars. Birds and bees and frogs were all dying, the seasons were out of joint, and instead of grieving, people wandered like zombies, dull eyes glued to soul-sucking screens. My partner and I had, in our selfishness, doomed our child to life on a dystopian planet, like some science fiction refugee, and there was no way I could see to shield her from the storms looming on the horizon. I'm sorry, I told her, weeping as her tiny fingers gripped mine. I'm sorry you have to live in this broken world. Anyone who pays much attention to climate scientists or to reporting by journalists on climate change knows that the outlook is grim. It's a tired story by this point since people like James Hansen have been warning us for 30 years, but it goes like this. Waste carbon dioxide from burned fossil fuels is accumulating in the atmosphere and trapping solar energy, which is warming the planet at an astonishing rate. This global warming is radically transforming environmental conditions all over the planet, leading to a range of second order effects, including rising seas, destabilized crop yields, mass extinction, unpredictable and dangerously intense storms, drought, floods, heat waves, etc. The stress these effects are putting on human political, economic, social, and agricultural infrastructure will eventually be greater than anything we've seen since the 20th century's two world wars, and will probably outstrip those. It's not unreasonable to say that the challenge we live with today is the greatest the human species has ever faced. Anyone who pays much attention to politics can assume that we're almost certainly going to botch this challenge. The radical reorientation of all human economic and social production necessary to stop emitting waste carbon dioxide completely within the next five or 10 years is scarcely imaginable, much less feasible. It would demand centralized control of key economic sectors, massive state investment in carbon capture and sequestration, and global coordination on a scale never before seen at the very moment when the post-war political and economic structures that held the capitalist world together under American leadership are splintering, and extremist libertarians are dismantling the nation state from the inside. The very idea of unified national political action toward a single goal seems farcical, and unified action on a global scale mere whimsy. What's more, even if tomorrow morning we woke to a world socialist revolution committed to ending human fossil fuel, fuel use within five years, significant and dangerous warming is, is already baked into the system from all the carbon dioxide we've already dumped. There's a time lag between CO2 increase and subsequent warming effects, between the wind we sow and the whirlwind we reap. Our lives are lived in that gap. My daughter was born there. 
Barring a miracle, the next 20 years are going to see increasingly chaotic systemic transformation in global climate patterns, unpredictable biological adaptation, and a wild range of human political and economic responses. These likely trends pose unanswerable dilemmas. Should I start a 529 college savings fund for my daughter in the hopes that there will still be a stock market and a working system of higher education? Or would she be better served by learning to shoot, hunt, and live off the land? Should we raise her where we live now, Indiana, a state on the cutting edge of privatization where public services like school buses and 911 call centers and highways are failing and unreliable, but our middle class income allows us to own a home or should we try to move back to one of the blue bubble cities that still have some sense of public good, but where we'd struggle just to pay rent? And rising seas, storms, wildfires, and drought threaten even the wealthiest. There are no clear answers. Every choice is a gamble. The next 20 years will be tough. After that, it gets worse. The middle and later decades of the 21st century, my daughter's adult life, promise a global catastrophe whose full implications any reasonable person must turn away from in horror. Recall that World War II, including the Holocaust and other atrocities, saw about 3% of the entire global population annihilated. It staggers not only the mind, but the very soul to imagine what going through a population bottleneck that entailed losing 70% of the human species would look like. But that's what it would take to get us back to population levels circa 1940. Why 1940? Over the past 70 years, the human species has burst the boundary conditions for sustainable life on Earth through what some scientists call the Great Acceleration, an unprecedented spike in socioeconomic and Earth systems trends from carbon dioxide emissions, surface temperature, and tropical forest loss to fertilizer consumption, water use, and population. So from approximately 2.3 billion in 1940 to 7.6 billion today. A spike which represents, quote, the most anomalous and unrepresentative period in the 200,000 year long history of relations between our species and the biosphere. In the words of J.R. McNeil and Peter Englecke. And while we might hope that world leaders will correct course and somehow bring this great acceleration under control, Human history suggests this global bubble will burst like every other in crisis, chaos, and violence. One thing is certain, as McNeil and Engeleke testify, the great acceleration in its present form cannot last for long. On the other side of the inevitable correction, a hundred years from now, whatever homo sapiens are left on Earth are going to be scrambling to adapt to a hot, unstable, and hostile planet. Why would anyone choose to bring new life into this world? How can I explain my decision to my daughter, now cursed to live out this fate? And isn't there anything we can do about it? It's true that numerous engineering solutions exist that might help decrease and mitigate carbon emissions but the social and economic cost of these solutions are so unclear and contentious that widespread agreement on implementation seems practically impossible. Meanwhile, our political system has been hijacked by thieves interested only in looting the republic and undermining democratic rule. Faced with such systemic failures, many adopt the individualist approach that consumer capitalism inherited from Protestant theology and argue that it's up to each of us individually to make the personal sacrifices necessary to stop global warming. According to a widely cited 2017 research letter by Seth Wines and Kimberly Nicholas, the most effective things any of us can do to decrease carbon emissions are to eat a plant-based diet, avoid flying, live car free, and have one fewer child, with the latter choice having the most significant impact by far. Wines and Nicholas argue for teaching these values in high school, thus transforming society through education. The real problem with this isn't with their specific recommendations or with the idea of teaching thrift, which is all well and good, but rather with the social model their recommendations rely on. Contra Adam Smith and Margaret Thatcher 
Society is not simply an aggregate of millions or billions of individual choices, but a complex recursive dynamic in which choices are made within institutions and ideologies, which then suddenly change over time as these choices feed back into the structures that limit what we consider possible, all the while being disrupted and nudged and warped by countless internal and external drivers, including environmental factors such as global warming, material and social innovation, and the occasional widespread panic. Which is just to say that we're not free to decide how we live any more than we are free to break the laws of physics. We choose from possible options, not ex nihilo. I would love to avoid flying and to live car free. Seriously, I, I can't even properly express my loathing for flying without getting vulgar. And I lived without a car for several years in my 20s and early 30s, so I know that's possible. But my world then was largely limited to the range I could walk or bike or get to on public transit. My work was usually casual and close by, and I spent way too much time dragging groceries back home. Now, like most Americans, I live and work in a city that was built for cars and has abysmal public transit, and which also happens to be thousands of miles away from my extended family and my oldest friends. No car, no job, no flying, no Thanksgiving with the family. As for a plant-based diet, I could and perhaps should go vegan, though my years as a vegetarian showed me that totally foregoing meat leaves me depressed and enervated. I can do it, but it's a sacrifice I'm reluctant to accept despite knowing the moral and ecological costs of factory farming. As for not having a child, of course nobody needs to have children. No human being ever needed to propagate the species. Biological reproduction is completely unnecessary. It just happens to be the strongest drive humans have, the fundamental organizing principle of every human culture and the sine qua non of a meaningful human world since it alone makes possible the persistence of human meaning through time. My wife and I didn't need to have a child, but without one, our lives lacked something important. Not unbearably, of course, but we wanted there to be more. We wanted life to go on. To take Wines and Nicholas's recommendations to heart would mean cutting oneself off from the mainstream of human life. It would mean choosing a hermetic, isolated existence with a restricted diet and giving up any deep connection to the future. I know because I've lived like that and sometimes even daydream about returning to it. Everything seemed so pure and so simple. But like most of us, I can't or won't. I'm committed to this world, the world I live in, in all its stupidity and doom, because this world is the one everyone else lives in too my colleagues and students, my friends and family, my partner and daughter. This world is the only one in which my choices have meaning. Furthermore, taking Wines and Nicholas's argument seriously would mean acknowledging that the only truly moral response to global climate change is to commit suicide. Think about it. There is simply no more effective way to shrink your carbon footprint. <laughs> Once you're dead, you won't use any more electricity, you won't eat any more meat, you won't burn any more gasoline, and you certainly won't have any more children. If you really want to save the planet, you should die. And I, for one, would salute you. Such self-sacrifice would be admirable, even heroic, to die for the sake of the human world. But it won't save us. History is full of people whose commitment to spiritual ideals led them to such self-sacrifice, from war heroes to self-immolating Buddhist monks to Christian martyrs. But the wheel of suffering has never stopped spinning. Even if millions went vegan, swore off airplanes, sold their cars, and had themselves sterilized, it wouldn't significantly slow down global warming. Billions of human beings already live a subsistence existence right now, and most carbon waste is due to a small percentage of people who don't seem to care much about the consequences. Recalling Thorsten Veblen's theory of conspicuous consumption, we might even speculate that the freedom to pollute is a kind of status marker, a point Michel Serres makes in his book Malfaisance. 
If that's right, then we can assume that the wealthy parasites killing the planet are never going to give up their privileged destructive habits because those very habits are how they maintain their sense of self-worth. The real choice we all face is not what to buy, whether to fly, or whether to have children, but whether we are willing to commit to living ethically in a broken world, a world in which human beings are dependent for collective survival on a kind of ecological grace. There is no utopia, no planet B, no salvation, no escape. We're all stuck here in the same shithole together. And living in that world, the only one there is, means giving up any claims to innocence or moral purity, since to live at all means to cause suffering. While you could, if you had the will for it, go off the grid, your subsistence farm would still be a tiny holocaust for the pests who would seek to live off your bounty. Your land deed would still need to be recognized by the imperialist state, and you would almost certainly need to enslave animals, if not for food and material, such as milk, leather, and bone, then at least for labor. Living ethically means understanding that one's actions have consequences, taking responsibility for how those consequences ripple out across the web of life in which we are each irrevocably enmeshed, and making the effort every day to ease what suffering you can. Living ethically means limiting your own desires, respecting the deep interdependence of all things in nature, and honoring the fact that our existence on this planet is a gift that comes from nowhere and may be taken back at any time without warning. I chose to have a child with my partner because I believe in human life, because I want the wheel of life to keep turning. I believe in old people dying and new people being born. I believe in the sun rising and setting. I believe in winter giving way to spring and summer bending to fall. I believe in the season's first robin, the first snow, and the first cherry blossoms bursting and falling from the trees. I believe in squirrels chasing each other through the branches, possums awkwardly mating, and knobby-kneed fawns bounding through open meadows. Sometimes I think focusing on the horror of our coming civilizational collapse is just a way for me to avoid the grief I feel at losing the natural cycles and biological rhythms that climate change is already beginning to warp. The seasons are confused, the animals are confused, and nothing feels right, not the land, not the weather. But for all my grief and horror, I can't seem to let go of the dumb hope that we might somehow find the wisdom to live within our natural ecological limits. It's not really rational. Politically, realistically, making mass human life sustainable at this point would demand a world socialist revolution, since only a unified world government committed to radical economic redistribution and ecological justice would be able to initiate and manage transitioning the global economy off fossil fuels. Socially, spiritually, we need to throw away our bedazzling high-tech toys and turn our gaze back to the land, the air, the water, the rhythms of this world, and the other beings who live there. We'd need a world religion that worshiped Mother Earth and put harmony with nature over all other virtues. While we're at it, we should also probably put women in charge, get rid of nuclear weapons, and outlaw racial and ethnic discrimination. I could spin out the fantasy further, my own private utopia, and maybe that's a fine way to pass the time until we die. It's certainly a venerable tradition, from Plato's Republic down to the sophists of Silicon Valley. But I doubt we'll see anything like it come to fruition. I'm pretty sure we're going to keep fumbling along toward our doom, just like we fumbled our way into taking over the planet. Human beings are dependable like that. Nevertheless, the impossibility of utopian solutions to the problem of climate change or to the problem of being human doesn't signify the end of ethical thought, but its beginning. For it's only in recognizing the fact that our lives are limited, complicit, imperfect, and interdependent that we begin to understand what it means to live together in this world. 
When my daughter was born, I felt a love and connection I'd never felt before, a surge of tenderness and care harrowing in its intensity. I knew in a moment that I would kill for her, I would die for her, sacrifice anything for her. And while those feelings have become more bearable since the first delirious days after her birth, they have not abated. And when I think of the future she's doomed to live out, the future we've created, I'm filled with rage and sorrow. Every day brings new pangs of grief. I'm excited to see the world afresh through my child's eyes, as any parent would be, but have found her every new discovery haunted by death. Reading to her from Polar Bear, Polar Bear, What Do You Hear? I can't help but marvel at the disconnect between the animal life represented in that book and the planet-wide mass extinction going on right now. When I sing along with Elizabeth Mitchell doing Froggy Went a Courtin, I can't help but feel like I'm betraying Rosalind by filling her brain with fantastic images of, magical, of a magical non-human world when the actual non-human world has been exploited and despoiled. How can I read her Winnie the Pooh or The Wind in the Willows when I know the pastoral life they portray is lost to us forever? And how soon do I explain to her what's happening? In all the most important ways, it's already too late. There's no way to win this game, no way to hack life in a doomed world. I can't protect my daughter from the future, and I can't even promise her a better life. All I can do is teach her, teach her how to care, how to be kind, and how to live within nature's grace. I can teach her to be tough but resilient, adaptable and prudent, because she's going to have to struggle for what she needs. But I also need to teach her to fight for what's right, because none of us are in this alone. I need to teach her that all things die, even her and me and her mother and the world we know. But that coming to terms with this difficult truth is the beginning of wisdom. Trying to raise some Katniss Everdeen or Jedi Ray, however, isn't enough. Offloading responsibility for the world onto future generations is ethically inexcusable, precisely the kind of short-term selfish behavior that led us to this precipice and illogical to boot. Our children learn early to distinguish what we do from what we say, and they model their own behaviors on the former, not the latter. So no matter how much we talk about children being the future, if we keep acting like their future is disposable, then they'll take that action for truth, regardless of how convincing we find our own hypocrisy. But there are even bigger issues with seeing climate change as the future's problem instead of our own. One is time. One of the reasons coming to terms with climate change is so difficult is because it takes time. It unfolds in time. And we're not that good at foreseeing trend lines that go against our narratives of how things should be. We tend to rely on two kinds of temporality, which the ancient Greeks called chronos and kairos. We might call them day-to-day -day time and event time. In day-to-day -day time, we tend to assume everything is going to be much the same as it was yesterday, within the predictable cycles of change to which we become accustomed. The sun will rise and fall, we'll get up and go to work, We'll get a bunch of emails and take too long to answer them. While wow, football and gives way to basketball, and we celebrate the various shopping holidays that mark our calendar, Memorial Day, Prime Day, Black Friday, Christmas. And children get older and go to college and have their own children and eventually disappear into retirement homes. The, un the regular unfolding of life as we conceive it is the basis for our sense of normality the frame that shapes our decisions, and the implicit backdrop against which we judge new information. In event time, on the other hand, day-to-day -day rhythms are suspended. A carnivalesque mood takes over. Our social structures reveal themselves as the willed collective illusions they are, and we see ourselves emerge for a moment into an open clearing of nearly infinite possibility. Event time is precisely the moment of action in crisis, the now when everything can change. These two kinds of temporality constitute a dynamic, dialectical back and forth in which everything is normal until it isn't, and then there's a new normal. Unfortunately for us, and somewhat ironically, climate change doesn't fit this temporal dynamic 
because climate change is a gradual process happening year by year, punctuated not by one global transformational event, but by an unpredictable series of increasingly damaging local disasters. Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, the monsoon floods in India and Bangladesh that killed more than 1,000 people, the California wildfires of 2017, any one of these catastrophes might have been the event which changed everything, except that each one was, in the end, no more than a regional phenomena. None of them achieved the universality of a true event, that quality which, for example, led the French newspaper Le Monde to declare after 9-11 that nous sommes tous Américains, we are all American. There is as yet no universal we who might respond to climate change, only an abstract we who are all going to die in our individual ways. For most of us, the day-to-day -day time of global capitalist civilization remains the beating pulse of our lives even as the world around us crumbles and changes into something strange and awful. By the, time, by the time the event we seem to be waiting for happens, we will have already lost too much to be able to do much about it. By the time the moment of decision arrives, our fate will have already been sealed. Thus, even though we live in the gap between the wind and the whirlwind, taking that gap for a momentary reprieve is a mistake the catastrophe is now, even if it's almost impossible for most of us to see that fact through the blinders of day-to-day -day time. And that very dissonance is perhaps the defining truth of our era, the key to its schizophrenic character, the red thread that connects the hashtag Me Too, the Middle East, Arctic sea ice collapse, Russian hacking, Black Lives Matter, Trumpism, the rise of the libertarian right and the socialist left, our seemingly insatiable desire for losing ourselves, binge watching Netflix, the monality of our workaday lives, and the dramatic fever dreams we live out online. I could and will raise my daughter to be a member of the Vuvalini resistance, feeding her a diet of rad American women A to Z, Beyonce and Mad Max Fury Road, but we still have to live through the next 20, 50, 70 years. More to the point, we need to get through the next 12 months, the next six weeks, the next 48 hours. The other major issue with framing climate change as our children's problem is that while some degree of warming now appears inevitable, the range of possible outcomes over the next century is wide enough and the worst outcomes extreme enough that there is some narrow hope revolutionary socioeconomic transformations today might save billions of human lives and preserve global civilization as we know it in more or less recognizable form, compared against an all too real possibility that unchecked emissions even over the short term could lead to runaway greenhouse warming, making our planet literally uninhabitable for human beings and leading to human extinction. The range of possible outcomes decreases every day, shifting month by month toward the more apocalyptic end of the spectrum. And waiting 20 years, 15 years, even five years, may well see the window for saving humanity slam shut. Our children will not face the choices we face. They won't have the opportunities we now have for action. They'll confront a, wave, a range of outcomes whose limits were determined by the choices we made. So we're back to the problem of what to do. It seems clear that if we want to transform the global economy by shifting off fossil fuels to renewable and nuclear energy, supplemented with carbon capture and sequestration, then we need some kind of centralized control over the economy. We could start by nationalizing energy production and other major industries, expropriating and redistributing the wealth of the 1% so that it can be put to work for the rest of us, then joining together with the other nations of the world in a single government that sees the needs of all humans as equal, regardless of race, creed, color, sexual orientation, homeland, or gender. <clears throat> this world government would necessarily require the legal and military power to enforce its decrees however they were legislated, so it would also need to have a monopoly on force. First dismantle the plutocracy, then dismantle the nation state. If you think this sounds like socialism, you're not wrong. 
In a way, in a way, Trumpism has done us a great service by driving apart the contradictory poles of individual greed and collective good, which had been uneasily joined under capitalism, and forcing a new articulation of collective global political life free from the dead hand of the market. But the challenge of figuring out how we might form a world socialist government is almost as difficult a question as figuring out how to address climate change. Wars are fought over such questions. I just don't see any other option that offers a real chance for navigating and coping with global warming and its ramifications without risking apocalyptic devastation and human extinction. Non-binding treaties like the Paris Agreement aren't going to do it. Carbon markets aren't going to do it. Broken democracies like our own aren't going to do it. To be honest though, having a child hasn't really inspired me to acts of self-sacrifice in the service of abstract and doubtful goals such as a global socialist revolution. Rather the opposite. I've had to start thinking about schools, healthcare, housing, and investment in whole new ways. I feel a deep obligation to provide for my child's future within the structures of contemporary American society, which demands of me making some kind of uneasy peace with America's brutally hierarchical, racist, and individualist socioeconomic culture. This is how young radicals become middle-aged liberal hypocrites. My love for my daughter is overwhelming, fierce, and irrational, and consumer capitalism exploits that every day by insisting, demanding, cajoling, whispering in my ear that if I don't do everything I can to make sure my child has more than yours, more whatever, the best whatever, then she's going to fall behind. That if I don't push her, push her to learn her alphabet before the other kids, she'll never pass the tests to get into the prestige kindergarten, which means she'll never get into college and she'll wind up wasting her life as a checker in a grocery store. That if I don't buy her the expensive wooden skill building puzzle or the organic kale avocado puree, then I'm condemning her to a slippery slope of disappointment, failure, prostitution, and opioid addiction. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the immense engines of capital, I have learned, have a whole array of forces that only activate once you've had children, and then they fall on you with the force of a thousand suns. When I try to think about climate change from this perspective, the only thing I hear is, we're gonna need a bigger boat. It takes real effort to remind myself that there is no boat. I have to work to remember that my daughter's fate is not hers alone, but shared inexorably, inevitably, despite the fact that the rich may be able to cope with climate change better than the poor for a while. Money means you can flee so you don't get stuck in the Superdome. Money means you can rebuild your house after it's destroyed by wildfires or floods. Money means access to institutional and governmental resources hidden from the poor behind complex, unwelcoming bureaucracies. Money means you can prep for disasters with insurance, kitted out go bags, and second homes in Montana or New Zealand. But money won't stop the seas from rising or the wind from blowing. Money won't save the Arctic and it won't save Miami. And once the system starts to fall apart, all those ones and zeros in their bank accounts will evaporate. And all the gold the preppers have carefully hidden for end times will be revealed for what it is, a not especially useful yellow rock. As I said before, the real choice we face is not what to buy but rather whether we're willing to commit to living ethically in a broken world in which human beings are dependent for collective survival on ecological grace. Joining the democratic socialists of America might be a start, but then what and what else? How do we live with, in, within this crisis? How do we change the world on a human scale? And how do we teach our children by example and not just with words and stories. I'm too much a Westerner, I'm the West Coast Westerner, to want to tell anyone how to live. Too much a child of pioneers, too much myself, an individualist, committed a priori to the idea that each of us has to work out our own salvation, and skeptical of the claims of gurus who give you 12 easy rules to follow. 
But in the spirit of American can-do pragmatism, I will offer a few broad suggestions. First, we should organize locally and aggressively. This will not only connect us to our neighbors, but it's also the most likely path to world socialist revolution. It's extremely unlikely that we'll bring about a revolution from outside the system. As long as it's us and them, they have the guns, the laws, and the money, and will outmaneuver us every time. But as Trump has shown, the system itself is far more vulnerable to take over than anyone had suspected. A socialist revolution from within now seems possible, but it's going to take dedicated cadres and bold individuals committed to a long-term strategy of dominating state and local governments while building a national and international movement. Second, and perhaps counterintuitively, we need to do less. Our daily lives are caught in manic cycles of pointless production and frenzied consumption, desperate bids for connection and whiplash reactions from your morning coffee to your morning emails to Twitter outrage and backlash to the stiff drink or dank bud or pills you need to chill at night, all of it powering a vast cultural machine that feeds on our anger and fear as much as it feeds on coal, oil, and natural gas. One must labor in order to eat, it's true, and we must work to repair the broken world. But so much of what we do is unnecessary, unconsidered, and reactive that we live out our days distracted and drained and unfocused. Slow down, do less, do the one thing that matters rather than the 15 that don't. Third, we should all meditate, sit, Stare at the wall and do nothing. Be nothing. Five minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, an hour, six hours, whatever you can manage. Attend to your breathing. Watch your thoughts and feelings rise and fall like the wind and rain. Watch your mind chase itself, wrap itself in knots, and remember that your thoughts are not you. Your feelings are not you. Human existence is a circuit of desire and suffering. Suffering arises from desire, desire arises in reaction to suffering, and fulfilling your desires satisfies you for a moment, then leads inevitably to more suffering and more desire. The way to learn to live with this fundamental dilemma is by practicing detachment, learning to disidentify from your desires, and slowing your reactions until they become conscious. The best way to do all that is through regular meditation. Best way I've found. Finally, we need to learn to die. It's not only our thoughts and feelings that are transient, emerging and disappearing over time, but ourselves. We each have our allotted span of years on the planet, some more, some less, and then we return to the nothing from which we came. Learning to accept this simple fact is a difficult, lifelong task, but doing so is the first step in understanding that the self isn't a unique, isolated thing at all, but a product of generations and a being enmeshed within a world, an emergent accumulation of energy and matter, a moment in a cycle, a transmaterialization of stardust, the expression of a vibrant, buzzing universe, a future, and a past. Everything dies. But what we do while we live, lives on, in our sons and daughters, in the worlds we make or destroy. We're all doomed. That's simply the condition of being born. But it's also the condition that makes a new future possible. Now what? Thank you. <laughs>